Well, good afternoon. This is Pastor Logan here at Messiah Baptist Church, 210 Congress Street, right here in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Listen, we're ready for Bible study. Get your Bibles ready. Get your pens ready. Get some paper. Take some notes. We're back again. Uh, Elder Michelle Roseman. I told you she would bless you the last time. She's going to be a blessing to us again today. So let's hear what God has to say through her. Enjoy the study. Remember, keep studying to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Money. Power. Peace. We all value something or someone. But does God say anything about who we should value? As the world celebrates the great achievements of women during Women's History Month, let's prepare to study what God says about the value of godly women. My name is Elder Michelle Roseman, and on behalf of Pastor Logan of the Messiah Baptist Church in Bridgeport, Connecticut, Welcome to part two of a lesson entitled, The Value of Connecting with Godly Women. The Value of Connecting with Godly Women. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your presence. And we know that in your presence, there is fullness of joy. We thank you for lifting depression, and for giving answers to those who have questions. We pray that you would manifest yourself through your revelation of your word in such a way that people are helped and have hope. Help us to not just hear your word, but to be doers of it as well. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Before we dive into part two of the lesson, I do want to acknowledge Pastor Logan and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be able to share with the Messiah Baptist Church family and all those who are viewing. I also acknowledge First Lady Virginia Logan, Olivia, and Sydney. And I can say for my husband, Kyle and I, that truly it's been a blessing to see the Logans and how well they love the people of God and each other as well. It's truly an honor to know them. And they have been such a blessing to us in so many areas of our lives. So again, Pastor Logan, thank you for the opportunity to share God's word. So this is part two of a lesson that we started taking a look at the value of godly women and the value of relationships with godly women. This is a very timely topic as we look in throughout the month of March, we know that women are being elevated as it's Women's History Month. And that's very important because even though women are elevated in some spheres, there are many of us, if we're honest, and when we talk about connecting with godly women, it sort of doesn't always set well with us. That can be because of negative relationships that we've had in the past, or either how we view women in general because of how we view ourselves. But regardless of how we feel about it, based on what we have experienced in God's word, we see that not only does God value women, but he also values relationships with them. Let's do a brief recap. In Genesis chapter one, verse 31, we see that God says everything that he has made is not just good, but it's very good. So of course that not includes just men, but women as well. And if we look further in the scripture in Luke chapter two, verse 52, we see that Jesus, as he grew, he didn't just grow in his relationship with God, which is vertical, but he also grew in his relationship, it says, with stature and favor with man as well. And if Jesus is our example, and we see that he grew in both of these areas, it lets us know that God also has an expectation of us that we will not just be saved anyhow and just glad to go to heaven, but along the way, while we are here on earth, that we will develop and foster and grow healthy relationships. 
as the theme for Messiah Baptist Churches, and it's true based on the word as well, relationship still matters. But as we get ready to look in this second part of this lesson, begin to ask yourself, how do you feel about relating with women? There may be some women that come to mind right now or some that God is going to place in your life. And there's a specific assignment that he has on their life to connect with you, to bring you to a place of fullness and fruitfulness that you would have never been able to achieve on your own. If you just look at where you are in life now, it could be a woman who prayed for you, someone who spoke a word of encouragement for you, opened a door for you. And those are the types of examples that God wants us to remember and to keep at the forefront of our mind as we move forward in the lesson, because we don't want to block what he's doing because of a mindset that is not of God. So again, we establish based on God's word that there is value in women and connecting with them. Those relationships are so very important. And in looking specifically in God's word, there was one woman that we highlighted by the name of Esther, and we're gonna continue with her story today. But to give you a little bit of background on Esther, we know her to be the king or the queen rather to the King Xerxes. So Queen Esther, is the queen to King Xerxes. And even though she is in a position of prominence, she didn't start out that way. In the book of Esther, we see that she started out as an orphan, not knowing her mother or her father. So she was essentially raised by someone who was not her mother or father, a man by the name of Mordecai, who was her cousin. And that's significant because many times as women, we discount ourselves as being able to do great things for God or having someone connect with us and be benefited by a relationship with us because of the way that we started. We may not have done everything perfectly. We may not be doing anything perfectly now. Who is? But if God has called us to do something, if he has an assignment for us, God's Holy Spirit is able to work and to turn those negatives into a positive and use us to be a lightning rod and a blessing to someone else. So was the case with Esther. So why was she such a blessing to Mordecai and to the people at that time? Through Esther's life, she was able to keep the Jews from being killed. She herself was a Jew and Mordecai was as well. And based on a series of events, which will unfold more today, we see that she was able to be used by God to stop unnecessary bloodshed and to save a people. And this is a word of encouragement to those of us who are watching. Don't downplay what God wants to use you for. We're looking at Esther, but there I believe are some modern day Esthers, men and women, with the spirit of God is in us, there are great exploits that we can actually bring to bear. But we've got to believe that God wants to use us and put ourselves in the position to be used by God. And so based on Esther's relationship to Mordecai, which is a cousin who raised her, when she rose to position and she was in a prominent place, God actually used Esther to bring Mordecai into a relationship with the king. He moved from the outer court to the inner court. He also was promoted to a place of prominence and received respect and honor that he would not have gotten had it not been for Esther. And let me just ask, who are the women in our lives that because of their relationship with the king, we have been elevated. We have moved from the outer court of not knowing God to the inner court of having a relationship with him. If you have just at least one woman in your life that fits the bill, that has done that for you, we owe God a praise because there's nobody but God that is able to connect times and places and people and pull them together. And regardless of what we may think about that person, 
the fact that God used them to be a blessing for us is a reason for us to be grateful and to say thank you. Mordecai indeed had a lot to be grateful for because Esther did so many things to open doors for him. And let me just say too, for those who may be caretakers, those who are raising children or someone else's children, you never know the door that that person can open for you. They may be frustrating in the moment, but if the Holy Ghost gets a hold of that person, the very one that gives us many times the most heartache, God is working something in their life and will turn around and can turn around and be a blessing and open doors for you that you never would have been able to open on your own. This is what we see happen in the Bible with Esther and Mordecai. I'm sure he didn't think that him just doing a good thing and raising his cousin would have led to what it did, but she was the pivotal character, the godly woman, the connection that made a difference in Mordecai's life. So there are two other relationships that we want to take a look at, and we want to see Esther is in both of them, but based on her relationship with God, what happened to these people that are in the text? So let's go to Esther chapter seven, and Esther is in the Old Testament or the first part of the Bible. And I'm going to begin reading in chapter seven, verse one. That's Esther chapter seven, verse one. And I'll be reading the New International Version of the Bible. It reads this way. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, an adversary and enemy, this vile Haman. A lot was going on in this text. And I talked about how Esther saved the Jews from being killed. What happened was there was a plot that was cooked up by an evil conspirator by the name of Haman, who was on the king's court. And so here we are, Esther has gone to the king to let him know what's going on. And that's what we see in chapter seven in the verses that were read. Now, before we take a look at how Esther related specifically to the king and the blessing that she was to him, I want to point out a few things about Esther's demeanor and how godly she was. Even though she was in a position of prominence, notice the respect and the honor that she had for the king. He said, what is your request? And look at what she says in verse three, if it pleases you. Prior to that, she refers to, to him as your majesty. Even though this isn't a specific point about connecting with a godly woman, it speaks volumes about how women should be godly. Just because we're in positions and we have a place of prominence doesn't mean that we should be disrespectful to someone else who is in authority. Many times we will find as women and men as well, but speaking specifically to women, that 
doors don't open or people don't always warm up to us, it has nothing to do with our gender, but sometimes it has to do with an agenda. The way that we approach people. Sometimes we have a mindset, I'm gonna give somebody a piece of my mind. They're not gonna walk over me. And when we come in with that posture, be it man or woman, what we find is that people may bristle up for, to us and doors are not open because we're operating out of a place of disrespect. But we see that Esther was the exact opposite. Here she is the queen. She's a wife. She's in a place of prominence, but she still understands that there is a way that she is supposed to approach the king. Let's take it even a step further. And this is for men and women. Even though we may be saved and have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a level of humility that's needed when we approach the throne of God. Yes, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, 15 and 16, we're supposed to come boldly, but we're not supposed to just tell God what we want and expect him to do it like he's a water boy or like he's some Santa Claus just doing whatever it is that we want. But we have to always reverence him and acknowledge him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes, there is a boldness because we have access to him, but at the same time, there has to be a reverence where we understand that, Lord, you are the one that's in control. Lord, we serve at your pleasure. Lord, we honor you for who you are. And even though you have made us, we are not little gods, small g-o-d. There is something to be said for honor and respect. And I tell you, Esther really shows us that. And I believe that that is part of the reason why the king was able to receive her. Because keep in mind, in biblical days, and, and particularly in this setting, historical notes say that you can't just go up to the king. You can't just open the door and say, I'm your wife, I'm coming to speak to you. You have to be invited. Or either the king has to hold out his scepter. So what we see is that Esther was taking a risk to go to the king, she could have essentially lost her life. And so she understood when she was going to the king that there was a certain way that she had to approach him. And again, it lets us know how blessed and favored we are, even though God wants us to come humbly to him. We don't have to wait for an invitation. We don't have to wait until a scepter is extended to us. Evening, morning, and noon, I hear David say in the book of Psalms, he prayed and he cried aloud and the Lord heard his voice. For those who are watching now, you may be in a dire situation. Thank God we don't have to like Esther wait to go to the king. When we have relationship with Jesus, we can come boldly at any point to get what it is that we need from our heavenly father, who is the king of kings. But as it relates to this earthly king, we see that Esther knew how to approach him. And then because she knew how to approach him and make that connection, not only were the people of God saved, but this king actually got blessed. He got blessed in a few ways. We see that because of their meeting, the king realized, number one, who his enemy was. Haman is a person who had been serving on his court. He didn't know that he had a plot to kill the Jews. But Esther, his relationship with Esther and the king, that's when it was revealed. Number two, we see because of the king's relationship to Esther, unnecessary bloodshed was, was aborted. People weren't killed all because of the king's relationship to Esther. Number three, what we also see if we go on to chapter eight is that the king realized not just that Haman was against him, but Mordecai, who was on the outer court, was someone that had his back. So all of these things took place because the king connected with Esther. And could it be? 
that God is setting some of us up now, or there is some woman that's in our life, a godly woman who will be able to discern on our behalf and let us know that someone is either for or against us. Could it be that there's someone who will pray and intercede so that there will not be a massacre of our character or either we will find ourselves in a place of depression, that there will not be a spiritual death because someone has interceded and intercepted on our behalf. I'm reminded of a real life situation, something that happened to me a number of years ago. I was taking a business trip and I was calling for ground transportation so that I could go to the airport. I placed a phone call, but what I didn't recognize through technology, some stranger had intercepted my call, showed up to my house. I wasn't aware that this person was not the one that I called to take me to the airport. And I got in the car with that person. Long story short, I was kept safe. The Holy Spirit definitely covered me. But what I didn't realize until after the event was over, remember I told you this was a business trip. There was a godly woman back at my office who I didn't even know well. And she said, all of a sudden, and it happened to be at the time when I was getting in the car with this stranger, she felt a need to pray. She stopped what she was doing and started to intercede on my behalf. And I tell you, when I look back at that situation, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, that woman's prayer, somebody I didn't even know, was able to intercede and intercept what the enemy meant for evil in my life. So it is with many of us who are watching, you can think back over your life, someone who has prayed for you, someone who has interceded and be open because in some cases, the godly women that God wants you to connect with have not even come into your life. But when they do, they will be a blessing to you just as Esther was a blessing to the king. So that's one relationship that we see Esther had a great impact in. But there's another relationship that I wanna take a look at that's just a little more obscure, that's not as obvious, but it's a way for us again to see that godly relationships with women or women in godly relationships, there's a correlation and they matter and they make a tremendous difference. And to do this, before, I, before we go into the scripture, I wanna set it up a particular way. We're gonna do a little bit of a pop cultural quiz. Now, if I had you all with me, I'd ask you to raise your hands, but I can just sort of see you through the computer screen. And I know every hand would be raised if I asked how many of you have either seen or are familiar with the movie, The Black Panther. Most of us, if not all of us, have some familiarity with that movie. So I wanna see how well you know the characters in the movie. I'm going to show you some pictures and give you a couple seconds and see if you can figure out who the name is. So here's one picture. Do you know who this person is? If you said Chadwick Bozeman, you would be absolutely right. Okay, so here's a picture of another person. Do you know who she is? If you said Angela Bassett, you would be true and you would have it right as well. And for our final picture, do you know who this is? Many of us may not know who this woman is, but you have seen her influence all throughout the Black Panther. This is actually Ruth Carter. She's a celebrated, decorated costume maker and the one that made all the costumes for the Black Panther. Now, it's interesting because we know Chadwick Boseman, Angela Bassett, but many don't know her, but we see her work. 
And we want to shift our attention as we talk about godly women and the value of connecting with them. And I want to make the point that just because a godly woman is not in a prominent position doesn't mean that there is no value in what she does. I gave the reference of the woman who prayed for me when I was in the car with that hacker. Didn't know who she was, but that didn't matter because God still used her. And this is a word of encouragement to many of us who are watching now. We may feel that God is not gonna use us in a significant way because nobody knows us. If we're into social media, we see that we don't have any followers and someone has so many more followers, or we find ourselves in a job where we feel like we're at a low level, or maybe we're a single mom. So many scenarios, we're at home and we're senior and no one sees us and we feel as if we cannot make a difference. It is not by might or by power that things are done, but it's by the spirit of God. And when we take a look at this next relationship that Esther has, it is proof positive that just because we're behind the scenes doesn't mean that we are not seen by God and that his hand is not upon us to use us in a mighty way. So again, still looking in the book of Esther, let's turn our attention to Esther chapter four, and I am going to begin reading at verse 12. That's Esther chapter four, verse 12. And if I didn't say it earlier, I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible or the NIV Version of the Bible. And again, for a little bit of backstory, remember we talked about the connection that Esther had with Mordecai. So right here, Esther has yet to go to see the king. So she's preparing to see the king. Listen to this conversation that she has with her cousin, Mordecai. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Still taking a look at the value of connecting with godly women. The first thing that I see here about Esther is that she understands the need as a godly woman, first of all, to get help. Sometimes as women, it is our downfall because we feel like we have to do everything. Let me say it again, everything by ourselves and for ourselves. Sometimes, honestly, I even find it hard for me to accept help. And I know I'm not the only one who feels that way. Sometimes I may feel like it's a sign of weakness or I don't want to bother someone. But the truth be told, it really is pride. It really is arrogance because God never intended for us to do everything by ourselves. On a very basic level, that's why we have the Holy Spirit to help us. But then remember what we uncovered in Luke chapter 252. It's not just about our relationship spiritually, but then also that horizontal relationship as well. You look all throughout the Bible and you see that people are paired up because God never intended for us to be 
all one or alone back to Genesis chapter one, as he talks about, that's why he made Adam and Eve to be helpers for Eve, rather to be a helper for Adam, but still for them to have companionship with one another. So Esther, we see here, she understands that even though she's in a position of prominence, she still needs help. But look at who she goes to for the help. I know she speaks to Mordecai and, and gets all the Jews to fast, but then she says, I and my attendants will fast as you do. Wait a second. I and my attendants. Other versions of this says my handmaidens or my maidens. So Esther knows that she has a job to do, which is to prepare to go see the king. She knows she can't do it alone, but she decides to make a godly connection or a connection rather with other godly women. Let me just stop right there. How many of us would be able to do what Esther did? It is amazing. And I have been guilty of this at times as well, where we don't always connect well with other women. Many times we compete, we try to control, or either we compare. How come she's going to do it that way? I don't think she should do it this way. Why does she look like this? She thinks she's better than somebody else. It says right here that I and my attendants will fast as you do. We don't see anywhere that there's contention, but it just takes place. And granted, they're working with her. They're under her, so to speak, because they are her servants. But the fact that Esther was able to work with them and saw volume, or, or rather saw value in them speaks volumes. Let me say that again. The fact that Esther was able to work with them speaks volumes volumes. And many times it's a comparison and the control that keeps us from working with other women. And that's something we have to really, really guard against because God is not going to always have us women connect with other women who are just like we are. Let me expand it. For the men, for the boys and girls, whoever is watching, God is not going to always have us connect with people who are just like we are. Some of my best relationships have been with women who are decades older than I am. Their wisdom, their insight, their spiritual tenacity outpaces me on any day. Where would I be without having those older godly women in my life? And then there's such a value for having women who are much younger than I am. And, and what am I saying? Let's be open to whomever God wants to bring in our lives. Because it could be the very woman, the very person who is of a different race, ethnicity, age bracket, socioeconomic status, that we say we don't want to connect with. And God is saying, that's the person that I have for you. Because we see here with Esther and her handmaidens, there are several differences. Number one, she is royalty in this sense. And we see that the attendants are those that serve her. She has direct access to the king. They do not have direct access to the king. She is being served and they are serving her. Despite all of those differences, when it came time for her to get the job done, she realized there had to be something in those women that they were able to fast and she knew that they could fast. And not only this, but look at these women as well. She said that they were gonna fast. If we look at the kind of fast that Esther called for, do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. Many of us would not be able to do that this fast and for an hour, but she said three days, night or day. And it didn't say they were gonna stop being her attendants. So fasting, and as the scripture suggests, doing this simultaneously. Esther understood that regardless of what was going on on the outside, what their outward position looked like, 
there was something on the inside where they were able to connect with the king. And let me just say on that point, that's all that matters. It does not matter how much money a person makes, what they look like, how many followers are on social media, whether they're in ministry, out of ministry, what the race or ethnicity is. The question that we want to ask is the person godly? Is the person seeking God? Do they have a prayer life? Is that person discerning or is that person deceptive? And when we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, spending time with God in prayer and scripture, understand that that's somebody that we're supposed to link arms with, we want to make sure that we do it. Because there is a blessing when we do what God has told us to do. And notice and say ask, but when he commands us to do something, that's where the blessing is. When we are willing and obedient to all that he says, because we can't see everything. And sometimes we look at people with our naked eye. She doesn't look right. He talks too much. This just doesn't look right. But Psalm 32, 8, it says that he, meaning God, will lead us and guide us with his eye. He has the aerial view in every single situation. And so when the door opens and we sense by the power of the Holy Spirit that someone is supposed to link with us or we are supposed to attach ourselves to someone else, we ought not move in fear and trepidation, but we should be bold about it. So this is what we see happens. Esther says, I and my attendants will fast. And we know what happened. That fast was what was needed, what Esther needed to set the stage for her to go to the king and get the breakthrough that was needed. I, I tell you, in looking at all of these situations with Mordecai, with the maidens, with the king, where would all of these groups of people, where would they have been had it not been for God using Esther? She didn't just rise to a position of prominence and power so she could be cute. She was beautiful. She didn't just rise to that position so she could be waited on hand and foot, although she was. So what's the point? We have to understand that when we talk about and unpack this theme, that relationship still matters. It's not just about gimme, gimme, gimme. Relationship matters so I can get this and I can look good and I can feel good. But have, have we just taken an opportunity to look around us the world is hurting. People are dying, spiritually and otherwise. I believe that God uses lessons and teachings like this to set us up to be that lightning rod. And to echo what it says in Esther 4, 14, and paraphrasing it, who's to say that we have not been placed where we are for such a time is this, never underestimate what God wants to do with and through us. We really just have to be open because nowhere in this text do we see that Esther doubted that she was gonna go forward. She said, I have to be ready, but if I perish, I'm gonna have to perish because I'm gonna go to see the king. How many of us are willing to perish to get God's job done? Now, I don't necessarily make reference to a physical death, but how many of us are willing to perish as relates to our goals, our ideals, the way that we saw our life going? How many of us are willing to set aside who we think we should be at this stage in our lives. Because understand that when it comes time to do what God wants us to do, like Esther, it took time to fast. There were things she had to give up. She couldn't eat what she was typically eating. She couldn't drink what she wanted to drink. 
But the thing is that when we make those sacrifices, God is able to get in the midst of that and people on the other side of our obedience get the blessing. And that's what it takes to be a mature believer, not just that relationship up and down with the Lord and just saying, I'm going to just stay here and close my doors and no one else matters. But God is saying, I'm calling you to expand and to not just take territory for you, but for other people. Someone else is not able to fast. Someone else is not able to pray. And God will often use the situations that you have been in, that I have been in, to be a blessing to someone else. Someone is not able to spend time in the word and to find an answer, but you are. And sometimes it's not even a spiritual quest, but someone may have a natural need. Because when you look at Esther here, there wasn't, that wasn't a spiritual thing. There were people that literally we're getting ready to die had she not stepped in, had she not obeyed, had God not used her. People were gonna physically die. So let me ask, what are some of the physical, practical needs that God wants to use you to meet? It can be you're opening the door for someone to help them write a resume or to teach someone how to stream a meeting online or how to cut corners and, and make sure that your dollar stretches before your stimulus check comes in so that you can get all the groceries that you need for your family. I can't even go over all the scenarios. Suffice it to say, God is not just concerned about our spiritual needs, but also he will use us as women of God, men of God, connect us just for some practical everyday things. And the, the, the way that God works is oftentimes he will deal with the physical first and then someone is able to see the spiritual. He will start natural and then he will go to the spiritual place. But whatever way God wants to move, we just wanna be clay in his hand and say, Lord, here am I, send me. So to recap, relationships definitely matter. And in particular, we see that there is value in connecting with godly women. What are some of the things that could possibly happen based on what we saw in scripture? We can be moved from the outer court to the inner court as relates to our relationship with God. We see that we can be made aware of our enemies and those who are for us. We see that when we are the ones that God uses to be a lightning rod in someone else's life, that people's literal lives can be saved. Something else that we wanna consider as well, don't discount relationships that don't come the way that we think they should come. Again, Esther connected with these handmaidens, people who were serving her. They ended up being her spiritual armor bearers, those who were able to do spiritual warfare and to fast with her. Value in connecting with godly women. And the last piece to take a look at, all of this took place not just with any woman, but a godly woman. Her behavior, her mindset, the way that she moved, spoke to the character of God and what we see mirrored in scripture. And if we're honest with ourselves and what we see in the world today, the way Esther moved was really counter culture. What we would say is counter culture because she moved with a level of discipline that is always needed if you wanna get something done for God. She didn't just barge her way into the presence of the king. And even though she could have spoken out of turn, she chose not to. These are all traits that we as women of God and overall as people of God need to mirror. And you may be listening to this lesson and you're listening, looking at all the godly traits that Esther mirrored or even seeing some of the things that took place with the relationships between Esther and Mordecai. You say, this is so far from me. 
I can't even see that this would happen to me. I can't believe that I'm the kind of woman that this would, that someone would want to connect with me. My challenge to you is to bring it all to the king. Remember what we said earlier, at that time in the Bible, no one could just approach the king without being invited or without having the scepter extended. Isn't it a privilege that we have? It says again in Hebrews chapter 4, 15 and 16, that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. At any of these points of the lesson, if we find ourselves lacking, God, I'm looking for godly women, take it to the Lord in prayer. If we find ourselves being that woman, we feel something stirring on the inside. Seems like he's always bringing these people to me, but I just don't feel like I have it. Take that insecurity to the Lord in prayer. Or even after both of these lessons, you admittedly may be someone who says, I still don't trust women. I still don't want to work with them. I do not see the value in godly women. God desires truth in the inward part. But as we're truthful with him, ask God to shift your mind in such a way that it would align with what he is saying to us in this moment at this time. So do relationships matter? Yes, they do. And particularly with godly women. Let's close out in a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you in prayer. We thank you for what you have taught us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that as the days go by, that something that's said in this lesson will stir in our hearts and we will be encouraged to reach out to people who may not look like us, Lord God, and form godly relationships that will be a blessing in the kingdom of God. We thank you for Pastor Logan and for the First Family and for Messiah Baptist Church and all those who are watching. We pray that you would perfect the things that concern us and we thank you for the great work that you have started in teaching us that relationships still matter. Continue to move it forward in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On behalf of Pastor James Logan, my name is Elder Michelle Roseman. Thank you for joining us for the two-part lesson entitled, The Value of Connecting with Godly Women. Be open for what God wants to do, not just in you, but through you, that you may be a blessing to those around you. God bless you. Bye-bye.